I'm delighted to be here today and I, I would uh, like to extend my uh, sincere thanks to the uh, UK Punjab Heritage Association for um, having given me this opportunity of talking at such a distinguished seat of learning. Um, I, I have a lot to say and I don't have, I'm conscious I don't have enough time to say it in so I'll try and, and be as brief as I can and if there are any queries and questions we can uh, elaborate on them, on them uh, subsequently in the Q&A session. Um, uh, in today's talk, I'll be giving an overview of the contribution of the, sorry, of the role of uh, India in the Great War, uh, in general with a bit of an emphasis on the contribution of the Punjab and the Sikhs in particular. Uh, I'm conscious that this is a subject uh, that is uh, conspicuous by its neglect, and today's recapitulation of the role of these forgotten soldiers is uh, in my view, as much a tribute to their valor and sacrifice as it is to the resurrection of a memory. Uh, and as uh, Amin had mentioned, uh, the USI, where I work, uh, is uh, spearheading a project to highlight and examine both the role of the Indian Army in the Great War and the impact that the Great War had on India. And uh, recently, in one of our Facebook posts, actually, uh, we carried a link to a newspaper article which was titled, India's Forgotten World War I Soldiers. And upon this, somebody had commented, and I quote, I find this whole forgotten media slogan to be hilarious, uh, but it's good that the centennial is getting at some public attention. Uh, however, I don't think that uh, the phrase, the forgotten army, is a cliched one. And since the title of that newspaper article and today's talk has some uh, similarity, uh, I just take a minute to share my thoughts on that. Um, I feel that uh, this forgotten aspect uh, is central to much that the Punjab Heritage Association in the UK and we at the USI are seeking to do, uh, and also to the reason why we are in fact gathered here today. Uh, and that centrality lies in just one word, memory. Now, memories are constructed and retained in the human mind for a purpose. And if they are not reinforced or revisited, they tend to fade with the passage of time and other narratives take their place. So therefore, memorialization such as that we are engaged in today can serve a number of purposes. It can reinforce the identity of a diaspora or of a nation. It can be used to build bridges by recalling a shared yet, yet unacknowledged past. But most important of all, to give, dues, uh, to give due to the achievements of an army that has not merely been dispossessed of a narrative, but has effectively been written out of history. And I will elaborate upon this historiographical neglect subsequently. Um, now just to put the ensuing narrative in context, uh, I'd like to highlight a few points. And first of all, we'll do well to remember that when the war broke out in 1914, India was still a con uh, colony in the British Empire and the Indian Army was one of the main pillars uh, of the colonial edifice. Uh, by virtue of the subcontinent's uh, geostrategic location, um, although it wasn't mandated to do so, the Indian Army had for long acted as an Imperial Fire Brigade, and its soldiers had seen service uh, in numerous campaigns around the world in the 19th century. Uh, just in the 20 years and the two decades preceding the war, as you can see from the slide, uh, the Indian Army had uh, taken part in numerous uh, um, campaigns uh, in different parts of the world. Uh, the one imperial campaign that it was not asked to take part in during this period was the Boer War, uh, which lasted from 1899 to 1901, and that point in time it was labeled as the White Man's War and no Indian soldiers were uh, deployed in South Africa in a competent role, although a large number of cavalrymen and grooms and sizes actually served uh, in South Africa along with the horses uh, and uh, 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 cavalry remounts that were sent there. The other point that needs to be highlighted uh, is the peculiar composition of the Indian Army. Uh, in the second half of the 19th century, the British in India had formulated what they called the martial races theory, under which only certain classes or religious groups were considered eligible to bear arms on the basis of their perceived hardiness or value as soldiers due to their martial ardor and bearing. Uh, the martial races theory restricted recruitment 
to a very narrow demographic base and was based upon a combination of Victorian social Darwinism uh, and indi indigenous caste hierarchies. Uh, and this had as much to do with uh, the ornamentalist vision and self-image of the European colonial elite as it had to do with the way they imagined their colonial subjects. And so by this, the uh, British had determined uh, which ethnic groups and subgroups were competent to bear arms in the service of the Raj. Um, this was very similar to what the French had a system which they called the Ras, uh, the Ras Guerrier and Ras Non Guerrier. And an important aspect of this classification was perceived loyalty to the empire. And accordingly, in 1914, the Indian Army was organized into class units uh, of, uh, with class companies or squadrons. So therefore, you'd have uh, two companies of Punjabi Muslims, two of Sikhs, two of Dogras, two of Jats, and so on and so forth. Uh, in spite of the proven loyalty of these martial classes, the British were taking no chances after the uprising of 1857 when a large portion of the Indian army had revolted against colonial rule. So the combination or the composition of the various ethnic classes in a unit was maintained in such a manner uh, so as to ensure that the troops were unlikely to combine uh, together in a general uprising against the colonial authorities. And they could be used as a counter to one another if required. So the principle uh, of divide a impera or divide and rule, which was uh, perfected in Ireland, was actually liberally uh, applied to India, as all of you are uh, aware. Uh, a few favored communities, such as Sikhs and Gorkhas, were enlisted into single or pure class regiments. Uh, these were often the creme de la creme, uh, since they exuded enormous clan spirit and the homogeneity which was generated by the close-knit Indian regimental system, where son followed father into the same regiment, uh, ensured that very high standards could be set and obtained under dedicated officers. So the Indian units that served on the battlefields of the Great War uh, therefore were composed of soldiers from various rural ethnic groups or classes such as Sikhs, Punjabi Muslims, Jats, Garwalis, Pathans, Rajputs, Dogras, and Gorkhas, just to name a few. However, the unprecedented manpower demands of the Great War put traditional recruiting areas under great strain, and they subsequently opened the doors for recruitment of classes which had hitherto been uh, classified as non-martial. And these included ethnic Bengalis, Punjabi Christians, Anglo-Indians, Mahas, Ka Kachins, and so on and so forth. But this, um, hmm, sorry. Uh, the class system of organization did have its drawbacks, and with the entry of Turkey into the war on the 28th of October 1914, it was not initially uh, considered prudent to send units with a significant proportion of uh, Muslim troops into action against the Turks, uh, as the Sultan of Turkey as Caliph was the historical figurehead among Muslims. Uh, for example, two of the Indian battalions of the 29th Indian Brigade, which were sent to Gallipoli in April 1915, were withdrawn within a fortnight of their arrival there because they cons uh, consisted of, a, or rather they had a significant proportion of Muslim troops uh, 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 as part of their composition. And both these uh, units were sent on to France uh, where they served with distinction and, with, uh, and uh, later on, uh, even against the Turks in Mesopotamia where one of uh, their soldiers, a, Pans a Punjabi Muslim Rajput, uh, of the 89th won the Victoria Cross near Sanayat in April 1916. So apart from the political considerations which related to the op operational deployment, the class company system with its uh, narrow recruiting base um, uh, encountered severe problems of replenishment of manpower uh, due to the heavy war wastage on a scale that was both unprecedented and un unanticipated. So the totally inadequate system of uh, war reserves completely broke down, and um, as a result, uh, the manpower demands of the Great War led to an expansion of the recruiting base, as I mentioned, and this simultaneously raised the level of awareness and expectations of a large section of the Indian public regarding the very significant role of the Indian Army uh, in imperial defense, and also the political concessions that they hoped would follow as a result. So the Indian Army that served in uh, the Great War had swelled from uh, approximately uh, one and a half, uh, uh, well, 150,000 men 
to nearly 1.4 million engaged by the end of the conflict, and it served in, uh, with distinction in almost every theater of the Great War in France and Flanders, in East Africa, Mesopotamia, Gallipoli, uh, Transcaspia, the Army of the Black Sea, the Northwest Frontier, um, and even China. Uh, yet despite the fact that it served with honor and credit in nearly all these, in all these theaters, the contribution, uh, this contribution has been relegated largely to a passing mention in most accounts as well as commemorations of the conflict. And part of the reason for this, uh, as uh, uh, Professor Gurupal pointed out in his uh, introduction, lies in the political history of British India. So on the eve of the First World War, India was still a colony, as I said, and it was agitating for dominion status within the empire, a status that the colonial authorities were loath to confer. Um, sorry, that is Shahmat Khan who, of the 89th who got the VC. A mere two years before the war broke out, the Viceroy of India, Lord Hardinge, had written, uh, uh, and he's quoted on the slide. Um, and uh, so, in a sense, uh, self-government was something that was totally off the radar as far as uh, uh, the colonial uh, authorities were concerned uh, in regards to India. So in India, therefore, the war was seen uh, as an opportunity to press for home rule by proving its loyalty to the empire. And this is reflected uh, in Mahatma Gandhi's offer of unconditional support to Britain in her hour of crisis. And uh, that's one of the many, the numerous uh, statements that uh, Gandhi made in support of the war effort. Um, in a sense, what he was saying till as late as August 1918 that was that uh, India must support uh, Britain in her time of need, otherwise uh, it would not have the moral right to demand for greater political uh, uh, representation or autonomy. So, as a measure of its support to the imperial cause during the war, Britain, uh, uh, sorry, India provided Britain with not just men and material, but money as well. Uh, you can see the number of men recruited was about over 1.4 million. Of this, nearly 1.38 served overseas. Uh, India made a contribution of 100 million pounds towards the cost of the war, plus uh, equivalent uh, of 80 million in equipment and stores. And according to the CWGC, they say that in the context of present times, 100 pounds in 1917 would be worth 34,000 pounds today. So that is actually a staggering figure for uh, a country that was as uh, poor as India was. And this was to have a considerable political uh, impact uh, in the aftermath of the war. So, uh, the Indian Army, uh, which was often derided as a mercenary force by uh, educated nationalists in a veiled attack on the British policy in India on the British presence itself, was therefore encouraged to serve in the war uh, by the same nationalists in the hope that it would result in political gains for India. Uh, however, in spite of India's sterling contribution to the war effort, it would be nearly three decades before her demands for political representation and by then hardened uh, from home rule to complete independence would fructify. But by then, uh, world events were overtaken by another world war, where the Indian divisions were once more to take the field, this time in the barren deserts of uh, uh, North Africa, uh, the, and in Italy, Malaya. And within in independence, the regiments and batteries that served in the Great War, uh, and uh, indeed the Second World War, those of, were split between the armies of three countries, those of India, Pakistan, and Great Britain. And the memory of those soldiers that had served a now discredited empire were all but forgotten. Uh, the lack of a political identity in 1914 thus served to rob Indian soldiers not just of an acknowledgement of their role or a commemoration of their sacrifice, but also of their place in history. So uh, this talk uh, therefore seeks to provide a blatant acknowledgement of a forgotten legion, those Indian soldiers who contributed an extensive footnote 
to an event that irrevocably changed the course of modern world history. Uh, The, as I had mentioned before, uh, during the uh, First World War, the Indian Army fun uh, functioned as a global strategic reserve and the global nature of its commitments is exemplified by none other than the 89th Punjabis, the battalion that was turned away from Gallipoli uh, to fight the un-Islamic Germans in France. And this battalion had the distinction of serving in more theaters of war than any, perhaps any other single battalion in the Commonwealth. Uh, having sailed from India in November 1914, by the time it returned home in September 1920, it had served in Southwest Arabia, in Egypt, in Gallipoli, in France, in Mesopotamia, on the Northwest frontier, in Salonika, the Caucasus, and finally at Constantinople with the Army of the Black Sea. Uh, that's quite some service. So, in the larger context, we come to the, uh, that was the larger context, sorry, we come to the role of the Punjab in, in the war. Uh, the Punjab in 1914 was a very different place from what it is today. As you can see from the map, it stre stretched from uh, the Khyber Pass in the north down to Gurgaon and uh, Delhi in the southeast. Annexed by Britain in 1849, the Anglo-Sikh wars were amongst the hardest fought battles by the British in their quest for empire. Uh, the Punjab it became the favored recruiting ground of the Raj after the uprising of 1857 which was put down by liberal employment of soldiers from the newly conquered province. Uh, in 1914, more than half the army was uh, drawn from the Punjab, and according to figures uh, quoted by Professor Tan Tai Yong in his excellent study, The Garrison State, uh, up to the outbreak of the Second World War, the Punjabi element, uh, excluding Gurkhas, never fell below 60%. Uh, the dominance of Punjabis in the respective arms of the army was far more significant. On the eve of the First World War, Punjabis accounted for 66% of all cavalrymen, 87% um, in the artillery, and 45% in the infantry. Uh, within the Punjab, the percentage of uh, population by religion in 1418 was Muslims were 51%, per Hindus were 36%, Sikhs were 12%. And the Sikhs, which formed uh, less than 2% of the overall population of India, uh, had a disproportionately large representation on the army during the days of the Raj. However, uh, I'd like to make a point that the Anglo-Sikh uh, relationship was at the best of times uh, an uncomfortable one. Uh, its peak coincides with what may be decided, uh, what may be termed as the high noon of the British Raj. And in September 1897, as many of you would be aware, a small band of 21 Sikh soldiers of the 36th Sikhs fought to the last man in the last round uh, at, uh, to defend a small outpost on the Samana range, uh, that of Saragari. And uh, uh, each one of these uh, defenders of Saragari was admitted to the Indian Order of Merit, which was then the Indian equivalent of the Victoria Cross. Uh, another detachment of the 36 Sikhs that had gallantly defended Fort Gulistan on the same ridge uh, against attack by thousands of tribesmen at, uh, at the same time won an unprecedented 35 awards of the Indian Order of Merit for distinguished gallantry. The memorials were built at Firozpur and Amritsar and tales of their valor were recounted in cantonments and bazaars across the length and breadth of the land. However, this honeymoon of the Sikhs with the British Raj was very soon about to end. Less than 10 years later, at 19, 1907, with uh, began the uh, in, in incipient rumblings of uh, political resurgence, re-awareness amongst, uh, particularly amongst the Sikh community in the Punjab. Uh, and as I had mentioned earlier, the 1890s, which could be taken as the high noon of the Raj and its relationship with the Sikhs. Uh, 50 years of British rule and service in the colonial army and police had exposed the favored Punjabi manpower to lands and opportunities far beyond the confines of India's borders. Apart from the Indian Army, Sikhs and Punjabi Muslims provided military and police contingents that were employed in various parts of the globe. Uh, they saw service in British East and Central Africa, in Somaliland, Borneo, Malaya, Shanghai, Hong Kong, and Singapore, among others. This exposure, along with increased immigration, education, and political awareness, particularly among the Sikhs, gradually saw them come into conflict with the attitudes of racial superiority and exclusiveness that were still ingrained in the colonial authorities in India. 
as well as to a far greater extent in the self-governing colonies of Canada, Australia, and South Africa. In the decade following 1897, when the Sikhs were lionized and made much of, uh, the relationship began to soar at an alarming rate. The Sikhs were a proud people and one that had a sharp sense of political identity and awareness. The rise of the freedom movement aroused their patriotic instincts uh, and the advent of revolutionary terrorism found resonance among them. The Komagata Maru incident of 1914, which centenary we also celebrate this year, where a shipload of mainly Sikh immigrants, many of them ex-soldiers, were turned back from Vancouver under the discriminatory continuous gen journey regulation and the subsequent rise of the highly intellectualized Gadar party with its avow avowed aim of uh, inciting the populace of India to revolt and overthrow the British government had a huge impact on the colonial authorities. In the Proceedings of the Army of India Committee of 1912, a special section you actually find is devoted to questions dealing with Sikh soldiers. And the following extracts from depositions of high-ranking British officers before the committee are illuminating. It says, from a military point of view, Sikhs are suffering from swollen head, Colonel E.H. Bingley. The Sikhs are the class with which, which would give the most anxiety, Sir Michael Glover. The Sikhs are, for many reasons, of special interest to everybody engaged in maintaining British rule in India. Sikhs are suffering from swollen head, Sir Charles Cleveland. Uh, the feeling of uh, a so-called unrest which existed more or less throughout the native army in 1907-8 have ha entirely disappeared except among the Sikhs who have been spoiled to a large extent by over-recruitment and have thus got wind in their heads. Colonel H Houghton, I've heard of people getting wind in different parts of their anatomy, this is the first time. Uh, there are too many Sikhs in the army. They have lost their heads and think they are the salt of the earth, Sir jo James Wilcox. Should not be sorry to see Sikh class regiments changed into class company regiments, General, uh, General Birdwood. So as you can see, they seem to have taken the Punjabi saying, Serva Dasar Darda, to head. Just the whole thing about Sikhs having a swollen head. And these are just a few comments which are extracted at random, but they do serve to highlight the delicate nature of the Anglo-Sikh relationship in the years running up to the Great War. And it's of interest to note that among the British officers whose views are uh, listed above, Wilcox rose to command the Indian Corps in France, while Birdwood became commander of the Anzacs at Gallipoli. This rather preca precarious state of affairs continued till the end of the war, culminating in the infamous Jallianwala Bagh incident at Amritsar on 13th April 1919. All of you are aware, I'm not going to go into details of that. And it took the post-war development of the rise of the Akali movement to jolt the authorities and finally send them on the path of assuaging uh, Sikh sentiment. In 1920, the Sikhs in the Punjab started a campaign aimed at free, uh, freeing their principal Gurdwaras, temples, uh, from the control of their hereditary incumbents. And this campaign quickly gathered momentum and within a few months had developed into a non-violent anti-government movement. Unlike the rather short-lived 1919 disturbances and non-cooperation Khilafat movement in the Punjab, the Sikh agitation, which came to be known as the Akali movement, subsequently did not cease until 1925, and this caused very considerable concern to the Punjab authorities as well as to the government of India. Uh, the Akali movement was not limited, uh, as in past cases of anti-British agitation involving the Sikhs to small groups of disaffected Sikhs or returned immigrants, or Congress sympathizers. At its height in 1922, the unrest encompassed the bulk of central Punjab's Jat Sikh peasantry, uh, one of the most militarized sections of Punjabi society. The Sikh community's martial traditions, which were fostered by their religious doctrine and culture, had been kept alive during British rule by the uh, recruitment policies of the Indian Army. Uh, where in 1920, one in every 14 adult male Sikhs in the Punjab was in military service. This meant that the abiding allegiance of the Sikh community to the Raj was a matter of considerable uh, uh, importance and their estrangement, especially that of the Jat Sikh peasantry, would adversely affect the Sikh regiments of the Indian Army. It, would al it also meant that if the community as a whole was provoked into open rebellion, Britain's British hold on the Punjab could well nigh prove untenable. So it's interesting to know that the first award of the Victoria Cross to a Sikh soldier took place in April 1921 at the height of the Akali movement and shortly following the incidents at Tarantaran, which was in January 
uh, of that year, and then Kana Sahib in February, in which many Sikhs lost their, lost their lives. Uh, Sipo Aisha Singh of the 28th Punjabis won a very scarce interwar award of the Victoria Cross. They were one of only total five which were awarded uh, in the British Empire between 1920 and 38. Uh, for gallantry and devotion to duty uh, beyond praise in Waziristan on the Northwest frontier. And for those uh, who may um, decry the suggestion that the award of the VC had any political implications, I'd like to put forward the inst instance of the oft-related story of Jamedal Mir Dust. Um, uh, Jamedal Mir Dust of 55th Cokes Rifles was in a Freedi from Tira on the Northwest Frontier Province. And he became the first Indian officer uh, to win the VC uh, first Indian officer, uh, not first Indian, um, uh, for gallantry during the Second Battle of Ypres when he was gassed uh, and where the Germans used poison gas for the first time. So before embarking for France, he had told his colonel that he would not return without the Victoria Cross. I quote, now that the Indians may compete for this greatest of all Bahaduris, uh, unquote, he said, quote, I shall return with it or remain on the field. So while undoubtedly a brave soldier, and he had previously been awarded the IOM for gallantry during the Momand campaign in 1908, uh, his case for award at the VC was definitely helped by the actions of his brother, Jamidar Mir Must of the 58th Rifles, who deserted to the Germans along with 14 other Afridi sepoys of his company, declaring that he would not fight in the army of a country uh, that had declared war against the Khalifa of Turkey. Mir Must was dined and fated by the Germans. He was presented to the Kaiser, who in turn gave him, it said, gave him the Iron Cross. And uh, 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 this was accompanied by a major propaganda blitz aimed uh, uh, at the British Indian Army's considerable Muslim soldiers. Uh, the Mir Dust was presented with his VC by no less than his majesty, the king, uh, as to match, perhaps, the Iron Cross presented to his brother by the Kaiser. Uh, the tale may be apocryphal, but it is worth repeating here in the context of this talk. Now, during this project, uh, we actually were looking at some slides, or uh, some photographs uh, from a German archive. And in 1915, there was an expedition which was sent by the Germans. The Germans actually spared, uh, spared no effort to try and foster uh, a revolt amongst uh, uh, the Muslim soldiers of the Indian Army. They even spread out the rumor that the Kaiser had converted to Islam, and uh, they uh, put out a call for jihad. And in 1915, there was an expedition sent to the Emir of Kabul, which was called the Naidamaya Hentig expedition after these two Pr Prussian officers that led it. And uh, as part of the Naidamaya Hentig archives, we found this photograph. And the verse where it says, the Sikh, uh, Sikh Patanin, the Sikh Patans, and there, on the left, is the man himself, Mir Mast. Uh, this was taken in Baghdad in May 1915. So, you know, we were obviously um, absolutely delighted to have found that, uh, that image. Well, um, many decades ago, uh, I'll just cover some of the... Uh, Many years ago, I, I used to go around uh, um, my village. Uh, there was a, a kinsman of mine who uh, began his career as a sawar in the guides' cavalry, and then at partition, uh, when the Sikh squadron from the guides came to the Indian Army, he transferred to the Sindh horse. So I used to catch hold of him and you know, tell him to take me around and meet uh, any old soldiers that I could, and I'd sit and talk to them, and it was great fun. Uh, in those days, Punjab villages were full of men that had fought in the Second World War. Uh, they'd fought in North Africa, in, in Burma, in Malaya. Um, but, you know, no, I, I didn't want to listen to their stories. Uh, the Second World War was just around the corner. I was more interested in, in World War I. Um, and um, among the recollections of these Indian veterans of the Lam, um, uh, as the Great War is known in the Punjab. Two stood, stood out in particular. One was about the siege of uh, Kotalamara, uh, where they used to say, uh, where the sepoys had to eat horses to survive. And the second was of the, uh, uh, the evacuation from Gallipoli. And the story that they would tell was of how uh, during the evacuation, which was carried out at night, 
so that the Turks would not come to know that the uh, army was actually withdrawing from the peninsula and the Turkish trenches were bare uh, 100 uh, yards away. Um, they had rigged up mechanisms whereby water would keep dripping into a can and when the can was full, it would pull down and a, a trigger would be pulled and a gun would fire. Now, this actually happened. I mean, there are accounts of that. If you, if you read the history of the Anzac, you'll find that uh, these mechanisms were uh, deployed as part of the uh, ruses to, Turk, uh, to trick the Turks into thinking that the army was still at its post. But, but these two instances were things which stayed on in the memory of these soldiers. Even if they hadn't been there, they knew of these things, and they would recount them with great um, delight when they were talking about uh, their memories of the war. And uh, another passing anecdote that was told to me by one of my neighbors, uh, uh, the charming silver-haired lady called Felice Pereira, um, she, was, she started her career as a uh, PS to the adjutant general, who was then none other than Leg uh, Sir Reginald Savory. And she used to tell me, she said that she had instructions to let in this tall, distinguished-looking Sikh uh, pensioner uh, straight into the adjutant general's office whenever he may come to call on the AG, irrespective of who was waiting in, uh, to see him. So she said, one day my curiosity got the better of me and I asked her, I asked her, uh, General Savory, you know, why is this man being shown this uh, special treatment? And he just replied in one line and he said, he saved my life at Gallipoli. Uh, on the screen is actually... A Sorry, so that's, uh, that is the 14th Sikh, um, which served at uh, Gallipoli. And I'm actually going to go on to a letter which General Savory wrote to the son. Uh, actually, he sent this letter to the son of that man who I got in touch with many, many years later. And it's just, it's interesting. He, he, he's... Uh, it's written in 75 and it says Sikhs and crash helmets. A real point at issue is not safety so much as the violation of religious conviction. In World War I, we tried to persuade the Sikhs to wear steel helmet, the steel helmet. They refused on religious grounds. We therefore refrained. In World War II, we tried again. They refused again and we refrained again. Had we insisted, they would have mutinied. With results, I leave to the imagination of your readers. It is downright ignoble that we should act now as we would never have dared to act when we relied on the Indian Army to help us fight our battles. A bill is being introduced in Parliament exempting turban wearers of the Sikh religion from wearing crash helmets when riding a motorcycle. I hope most earnestly that when the time comes, all members of both houses of Parliament will vote in favour of the bill. This was written, as I said, in the 70s and was sent uh, to this man. Uh, it just is indicative of the kind of strong bonds that uh, existed between the British officers and men of the old Indian Army. Now, India had a, a, a small but an extremely significant role to play in the Gallipoli campaign, which is famous in Australia and New Zealand for building the Anzac legend, uh, and which was to become the cornerstone of the national identity of both these countries. Um, and however, in spite of the near iconic space that Gallipoli occupies, occupies in their national consciousness, India's contribution is nearly forgotten. Uh, the 14th Sikhs, which is one of the few uh, uh, non-Gorkha units of the Indian Army, uh, composed entirely of uh, Sikh soldiers from the Punjab, uh, launched uh, repeated attacks in face of murderous machine gun fire against Turkish posi positions and the Third Battle of Krithia. And uh, on that particular day, the battalion's casualties amounted to 82% of the men that were engaged in the battle. Only three British officers were left unwounded. And this was the Gallipoli Dispatch. It's, it's very famous. Many of you may have seen it or heard of it before, but I will go through it again. In the highest sense of the battalion, extreme gallantry has been shown, uh, sorry, in the highest sense of the word, extreme gallantry has been shown by this fine battalion. In spite of these tremendous losses, there was not a sign of wavering all day. Not an inch of ground gained was given up and not a single straggler came back. The ends of the enemy's trenches leading into the ravine were found after the unsuccessful uh, British advance of the 28th June to be blocked with the bodies of Sikhs and of the enemy who died fighting at close quarters. And the glassy slope is thickly dotted with the bodies of these fine soldiers all lying on their faces as they fell in their steady advance on the enemy. The history of the Sikhs affords many instances of their value as soldiers, 
but it may be safely asserted that nothing finer than the grim valor and steady discipline displayed by them on the 4th of June has ever been done by soldiers of the Khalsa. Their devotion to duty and their splendid loyalty to their orders and to their leaders make a record their nation should look back upon with pride for many generations. So the gallantry of this regiment was also referred to by the Secretary of State for India in a speech in the House of Commons. And um, uh, the, uh, he personally attended a memorial service held in London Church for the fallen officers of the 14th Sikhs. One of the major problems that's faced by any researcher who works in the role of Indian soldiers in the uh, Great War is a lack of an Indian voice. Uh, apart from this uh, fortuitous uh, collection of uh, uh, letters, censored letters that's available in the British Library, which has uh, been referred to, uh, uh, there, there is very, very little else. Uh, but these letters relate primarily to the Indian Corps on the Western Front. Uh, but there are, however, a few other sources that do provide us with a glimpse of how the intercultural exchanges made possible by the war uh, impacted upon society and culture in India. For example, uh, in a remarkable letter which was editorialized in the June 1918 uh, issue of the Jat Gazette, which was published in southeastern Punjab, a Jat Risaldar of the 6th Cavalry named Tek Chand wrote, and in the, uh, I've, there's a Roman uh, English uh, version of it, followed by a translation of that para, and it was uh, editorialized as Medane Jang Se Khat, uh, I'll go on to the second uh, para, which I will read out in Urdu, where you, you can read the, um, the translation below. Uh, wo social kharabiyon ka zikr karte hain, jo hindustan ki mukhtalif komo, jatiyon, ke admiyon ki aapsi sambandhon mein hariz hain, aur jo unko gair mulkon ke saath azadana eklaak paida karne se rokti hain. Aap kehte hain ki, ehle France ne awal awal in baaton ko hirayangi ke saath dekha. Uh, when they went to France, the people of France were amazed at this absurd behavior where people would sit at different tables and not eat together or dine together. Sorry. Uh, 1914 se 1918 ta gair mulkon mein rehna aur wahan ke logon ke और आगे होने की उम्मीद है उसकी तरफ निहायत जोर से इशारा करते हुए जमादार साहब लिखते हैं 25 फीसदी से ज्यादा लोग ऐसे ख्यालात कर चुके हैं कि साथ ही मेज पर खाना सिवाय उस चीज से जिससे परहेज है खाना खाने लगे हैं that more than 25% of indian soldiers have now decided to do away with the old caste restriction then they would actually sit and dine together at the same table which was huge uh, for those of you who are aware of the kind of uh, uh, the, the hold that caste and uh, uh, its taboos had at that point in time. And the last parallel says, Paramatma jaise ki Hindustan bhaiyon ko abhi gair mulkon mein jane ka mauka de raha hai. This is really interesting. Meri dua hai ki arsa daraz tak ye is musibat mein fase rahe taaki unke dil ki garmi nikal jave aur mohabbate qawm dousre logon ki nakal karte huye unko batar tohfa ke mil jaye jisse ki wo iske aadi ho jaye aur khud garzi kafur ki tarah ud kar baaki sirf insaaf pasandi hi reh jaye he he prays to to god that uh, as a result of this great um, upheaval in the world he prays that uh, the people of india may stay stuck in this so that they continue to get the opportunity of traveling abroad and seeing how the world at large uh, uh, lived. So this letter, which is not an isolated example, um, is illustrative of the immense impact that the cultural interaction had brought about in the mind of Indian soldiers. This resulted in a desire to do away the restrictive customs and caste restrictions to bring about communal harmony and introduce female education in Indian society, among others. So while the general picture presented of the Indian soldier at the time was that, that of a simple, uneducated peasant, this was definitely not universally true. 
a large number of, well, a, a, a significant number of them were, were actually educated in the vernacular. They were regimental schools, and some were even proficient in English. And as part of the project, we recently had uh, an officer who came in with his grandfather's photographs and uh, other papers. And as you can see, uh, the central figure in, in that image is Subedar Patram. And on the right is a letter which is written by him when he was a prisoner of war in Turkey. It says from uh, Afyor Kara Hisar in Turkey in February 1917. And um, uh, how a Jat Risaldar from Gurgaon was so proficient in English is beyond me, but he obviously was. Because that's not just his only letter, there are a number of others as well. Uh, unfortunately, uh, he, he died as a, as a POW, as did the vast majority of uh, the 6th Indian Division that went into captivity at Kotalamara. Um, they never came back. So many years ago, I was talking uh, to an old cavalryman in uh, Rajasasi, which is a village next to mine. Uh, today, it's better known as Amritsar Airport. And uh, Dafidar Hadith Singh was a man who was speaking to. I was just telling Aman yesterday, I found the recording of, uh, just before I was coming here. Uh, he was the third generation to have served in Hodson's Horse. And his clan, the Sannawalya Sardars, had provided numerous soldiers and generals in the armies of the Lahore Darbar under Ranjit Singh. And he himself was related uh, uh, by his descent to the famous Maharaja, and he proudly pointed out his name in a family tree uh, printed in Ibbotson's famous Chiefs and Families of Note in the Punjab. Uh, and our conversation, however, revolved around his own military service during the Lam, uh, as the Great War is remembered till today. Uh, he had served in the last great cavalry campaign of history as a part of Allen B's mounted divisions that swept north through Palestine to rout the out Ottoman armies, paving the way for allied victory in the Middle East. His cousin, Jamedar Lachman Singh, was then a sprightly, bow-legged cavalryman in his 80s. He still had a smattering of French that he had picked up in the countryside of France and Flanders as a young sowar with the 18th King George's own Tawana Lancers. I still remember him telling me, he said, uh, when he joined up as a sowar in 1914, he said, Menu dodi uh, because he didn't have a beard, so they called him Milk Face. Uh, and uh, what surprised me a little was the grasp of the larger strategic picture of contemporary world events, which was evidently displayed by their soldiers. It's not that they were not, that they were unaware. They were, they were actually very, very aware of what was happening in the world around them. Uh, and I quote, the, the British were trying to break through the Dardanelles to capture Constantunia, Constantinople, in order to bring about an early end to the war against the Turk, he said by way of explanation. I quote again, they could not succeed and had to ultimately evacuate the Morcha, uh, which is front opposition, under cover of darkness. The guns and rifles were connected to a mechanism controlled by dripping water, which kept, caused them to keep firing long after the soldiers had left their positions so that the Turks would not come to know that they were withdrawing. This is once again the uh, evacuation of Gallipoli. Uh, that is... Um, uh, a photograph of my nana's, my mother's father's troop commander, Rasalda Rajab Singh Sarkaria. And that was the only thing, because they lost everything when they moved from uh, Sheikhupura in what is in now Pakistan. And I asked my grandmother, uh, I said, do you have anything of, uh, uh, of my grandfather? And the only thing she had was this photograph, which was framed in a normal black frame. Uh, and uh, when I removed it from its frame, I was actually very surprised to find on the right, it says, I am quite well, yours affectionately, number four, Jab Singh Sarkaria, prisoner of war, Konya, Turkey. And uh, my uh, nana was in the 7th Haryana Lancers, which uh, was part of the garrison of Kotalamara. Uh, interestingly enough, my paternal grandfather was part of the relief force that was trying to relieve, uh, march to the relief of, of Kut. Uh, they, they never succeeded. And uh, 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 the Haryana Lancers, along with the rest of the garrison, went into captivity. My nana, however, was very lucky because the bulk of the cavalry, one day before the Turks closed the siege, were, uh, uh, were allowed to march out. And they came back, and he came back with them. But his troop commander obviously stayed back and uh, became a prisoner of war. 
Now, when we talk of, uh, this is the last bit, and when we talk of uh, uh, India and the Great War, another aspect that deserves our remembrance is the alternate history of dissent and revolutionary struggle, equally marginalized uh, by mainstream post-colonial discourse, uh, as is the story of the sepoys who served and fought in the ranks of a colonial army. I've already made a, a reference to um, uh, the Komagata Maru and the activities of the Gada Party revolutionaries who tried to incite some Sikh soldiers of the army to rise against the colonial authorities. A number of them were sentenced to death and others to transportation or imprisonment for being part of a conspiracy to overthrow the uh, government. Uh, this slide uh, lists incidents of disaffection in Indian units uh, during the course of the Great War along with the cause and effect of that dissent. And you'll see that um, uh, the first three, that's the 23rd Cavalry at Lahore, 18 men were sentenced to death, 12 were actually executed, all were Sikhs from the central Punjab, and were acting in close cooperation with the revolutionary Gadar Party. The next was the 26th Punjabis, again they were influenced by Gadarites, the 25th Punjabis came back from Hong Kong, again uh, influenced by the Gadarites, and uh, lastly the 12th Cavalry. Uh, we go on to the mutiny of the very famous mutiny of the 5th Light Infantry at Singapore, uh, where 47 men were publicly executed by firing squad. Others, uh, 64 others, transferred uh, sentenced to transportation for life. The 113th Baluchis, 15th Lancers, uh, again Muslim regiments, which mutinied uh, or were disaffected uh, during the war. The, in the interesting point to note is that the Sikhs were all motivated by politics, whereas the Muslims were all motivated by religion in, in their descent. Uh, those that are familiar with the Sikhs, that should come as no surprise. <laughs> um, over here you can see Dr. Atma Singh of the 31st DCO Lancers. Uh, on the left, the British officer is General Sir Roy Boucher, who became the last British Commander-in-Chief of the Indian Army. There's Atma Singh with Roy Boucher's daughter, and there he is uh, just after a game of polo. Um, Atma Singh was from the uh, village Lalton Khurd uh, in uh, uh, Ludhiana dist uh, district. Uh, his father was uh, in the famous Guides Cavalry, which as you're, many of you may be aware, uh, who are familiar with the mythology of the British Raj in India, uh, formed part of the detachment uh, uh, along with the uh, British resident in Kabul during the Second Afghan War. They, fight, uh, they died fighting to the last man. And two of his cousins retired as uh, VCOs, Sardar Bahadurs from 13 DCO Lancers. So, but however, despite uh, uh, this extraordinary military heritage, it's the exploits of his brother that I find even more remarkable and worthy of remembrance, no less than the martial achievements of the family. And this in the center is his brother, Baba Gurmukh Singh Lalto, who was revolutionary extraordinaire, who committed his life to the cause of India's freedom, and was one of only two Indian freedom fighters ever to be sentenced to Kalapani twice. Uh, he's seen with his niece, uh, Mrs. Dalbir Kaur, uh, on his release from jail in 47. Uh, Gurmukh, Gurmukh Singh began his journey as a uh, revolutionary, as a passenger on the Kamagata Maru in uh, the summer of 1914. And uh, uh, that journey set him irrevocably on the path of committed opposition to the Raj, a path that he pursued with single-minded uh, fervor uh, till the end of his days. His valor and his sacrifice were in no way less than that of his other kinsmen. Uh, I still remember uh, speaking to him and uh, him recounting the tale of how when he was being taken uh, to prison uh, on the way to the Andamans, he escaped by jumping from a moving train into a river from where he made his way to Kabul. From Kabul, he went to Moscow, Moscow to Berlin. In Berlin, then he went uh, to the West Coast. Then he came back to India. He was again arrested and again sentenced to life imprisonment. And uh, his words uh, to uh, Mrs. Dalbir Kaur still ring in her ears. He said, do not think this poverty is the working of fate, of kismet. He said, I worked hard to earn it. So. At a time when we are pausing to remember, I think we'll do well to enlarge the window of our memory to include those who, along with our forefathers who fought in the trenches, uh, but who fought another kind of battle to give us the kind of dignity and freedom that we enjoy today. 
Um, so that's the India Gate at New Delhi, and it's a memorial to the dead of the armies of India who fell in battlefields around the world during the Great War. Uh, few people in India are today aware of its significance, and I close with a famous couplet on sacrifice and memory that is equi equally relevant to the forgotten soldiers uh, of the Great War, as well as the revolutionaries of Hind, which is Shahidon ki chitaon par judenge har baras mele, vatan par marne walon ka yahi baaki nishan hoga. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.